the story of British farming in the 20th century begins with a decline. British farmers couldn't compete with cheap grain from the prairies. So as prices fell, they farmed less land each year and spent less on upkeep. Wages were a pittance. We thought they were good days then because we didn't know any different. That's what we were brought up to. That was our way of life. But looking back on them today, I can't see anything good about them. I mean, it was nothing, only slavery, slogging for very little money. Women came to the farms in the first war in a campaign to reverse the 50-year decline and grow more at home. Submarines threatened the huge food imports, so a long-neglected industry became a national concern, but only briefly. After the victory parades, the women left, and the old priorities returned. The cheapest food came from abroad once again. Politicians knew low prices for the British consumer counted for more than the interests of the home farmer. Farmers were in a very poor way. I, can, I remember when we first bought this farm that um, valuation deteriorated by £1,000 in one year. Horses we paid £147 in 1917. One year later, they were valued at 47. And we had 10 horses, well, that's a great lot of money. I remember my father coming home and said, look here, he said, um, uh, can I get any more money from the bank? He said, um, I've used your money, and I've used, uh, used our money. He said, no, I might as well shoot myself. All types of farming suffered, and it was a diverse industry. The cereal growers plight was the most dramatic. During the war, they'd been guaranteed a price for their wheat to encourage home production. In 1921, the price support was abruptly withdrawn. North American grain poured in and prices tumbled. Farmers complained of the great betrayal and responded by cutting their men's wages. Farm workers' wages in about 50 shillings a week. In two cuts, they were down to 25. Yes, that's right, that is. And, uh, of course, that's when, when things started going wrong. That's when times really began to get hard. At the Norwich Corn Exchange, prices were falling daily. A cabinet committee was unsympathetic. Agriculturalists must make up their minds to face their difficulties without government interference and without expecting the government to subsidize them. The East Anglian farmers were hurt most because they specialized in cereal growing. They got rid of their wheat at whatever price it would fetch. Farmers began a self-sufficient hand-to-mouth existence. Less land was sown because it was cheaper to leave it as grass. The common response was dog and stick farming, keeping a few chickens and cattle that could be fed the grain. They cut down on labor. On family farms in the West and the Midlands, the work could be shared. But in the Eastern counties, where there was a large hired workforce, the relationship was still one of master and servant. It was the men's living standards that fell fastest. The farmer always had plenty of food on his table uh, at, at the expense. I suppose one could say that the farm was exploited by the, the farmer. You, you can imagine 30 shillings a week and nine pence off that for an insurance stamp, 29 the threats to take home, where a farmer, I suppose, could uh, have eight or nine pound a week going at his farm, and, and they certainly did have food on the table. Uh, when I worked at Ben Pines at Monsley, uh, on a Sunday morning, they used to give me a breakfast because I had to do a double milk round. And uh, I always had a better breakfast there than I could have ever had at home. The food, of course, was uh, bread and cheese or bread and jam. You didn't have butter on your bread. If you had, you didn't have bread and butter and jam, you had bread and jam, of which was homemade, of course, with blackbirds we used to gather and that type of thing. And harvest time was the best time of the year because we had plenty of rabbits. 
because these blessed rabbits, they, well, you know, they breed those rabbits. There's any amount of them. You come harvest them, you've had a lot of sport. Knowing any amount of people come from Saxon on them into the harvest fields. We're, we're so and so cutting, so and so's cutting, so and so. And the way they'd go on the bikes and, and run and run, as your binder kept going round and round, that kept up smaller and smaller, they kept running out. Perhaps there'd be one side, there'd be trophy with a gun, the other side, there'd be boys and men, dogs. And, you know, it's surprising. Although our rabbit can run, it's surprising how you can run them down in this long stubble. sport it was too. And of course once make them make some atosis come that put pay to all that. That was that was a good thing for the farmer but that done the poor people out of a, a lot of dinners. The next day the farm hands tray of the fields. Rich full sheaves are carefully placed one against the other in such a way as to permit the air to pass freely through them. A simple method unaltered by time or invention. You had these uh, lines of stooks, uh, like the aisles in a church, virtually, dead straight. There was a great emphasis on skills. Everything had to be straight. When it had stood in the field for uh, maybe a week, maybe two weeks, we used to say three Sundays for oats. But wheat, you could, um, you could uh, haul that to the stack at about uh, seven or eight days, if the weather was good. The horse and wagon would draw up between the, the rows of stoops and was loaded onto wagons. extra help was needed. Pay was by the day or the week, though in some parts of the country there was a system of piecework. Good old Peter, good old Peter. Had a good day, chap? Yes, not too bad, Tom. Not too bad. Now we're out of drink. Well, we can find some. We can find some. You had a good harvest this year, Jim? Yes, thank God. They can't grumble this year. No, they hadn't ought to, I shouldn't think. I shouldn't think they did. Well, chaps, I'll toast to the bumper harvest. Here's to the bumper harvest. The bumper harvest. Well, in the early days, cut harvest was a piecework. Uh, used to take the harvest so much for the harvest. Uh, when I first remember, it was about eight pound a week for a man and uh, about 30 bob for the whole harvest for a boy who used to ride the horses. And muck spreading was five bob an acre. I've done, spread many an acre of muck for five bob an acre. You didn't earn too much about that because you've got to go quite a bit. I can't really tell you how many heaps to the acre, but I should think about 250 or something like that. No, there was no dole. We never got the dole till 1936. And it's like holidays. We never had the Saturday afternoon until 1926. And one old farmer says, well, if they're going to have the half a day, they must have it on Monday mornings. Well, we went from half a day, to we got four days a week. And from then we gradually moved on, we got a week. Like Christmas day. You'd have about half a day Christmas Day, half a day Good Friday. Boxing Day was on her dive. You'd got to go to work. Isolated, the farm workers were in a weak position to negotiate either conditions or pay. The men's wages continued to be cut as farmers' own incomes fell. 
But when Norfolk farmers tried to reduce wages in the area by a further five shillings in 1923, the National Union of Agricultural Workers called a rare strike. About 10,000 men came out. Stroke lasted about six weeks. In some instances, there were fights on the farm where some what we call black legs worked and the, the, the other men were uh, incensed because they did and they'd let the horses out. Now, there wasn't quite so bad in this particular area, but there were occasions when temper sort of rose and one or two men did fight each other over this. And then the farmers gave in and said they would still pay the same amount of money. The three of the men came back and um, the governor of the state was waiting for them. We'd been up and paid the horses and um, asked them what they come back for. They said, well, we said the horses were dead. So how do they expect then uh, to come back and, and work dead horses? And of course, um, two of them began to uh, apologize this and that. And then one of them we wanted to get rid of, we told him we did, he, he better keep it to him. And so he said, well, what did my wife, what, what my wife say? Well, you thought about your wife before you came out on strike. But, you know, the men didn't want to strike. It's the intimidation of the others outside and what they were going to do to them. That's, uh, that's where the, uh, the, the trouble arose. And uh, there was nothing you could do about that. You can't work with a man ten months in the year and come harvest time and says, well, I'm going on strike, can you? I mean, there's that, that brand of loyalty, you see, you all hang together. You can't work to, to get a harvest and when they're fit to gather in, leave it and see it spoil. The farmer provides plenty of bread, beef and beer, and everybody else, dressed in their best, comes and puts it away. When eating is over, an accordion is brought to light. And music is played and songs are sung, which owe their existence today to the fact that father has handed them down to son from generation to generation by voice alone. Many have not even been recorded on manuscript. One of the factors that encouraged deference was the harsh reality of the tied cottage. With a job went a cottage, perhaps room for a few animals and a vegetable patch. But the moment a man lost his job, he and his family could be evicted without notice. There was a, a case up here in the village in 1928. They got an injectment order and the village copper come up the Friday night and he says to us chaps, he said, I've got to come up here tomorrow morning and put that poor devil out onto the road. He said, oh, I hope to God he's got somewhere to go. And luckily he had. And from then onwards, I thought, well, I'm not going into that trap if I can help it. Because once you get in that, it's very difficult to get out. They got a job and we got a job. And uh, nine times out of ten, we, we work together as a community. I mean, there's no, uh, um, if one farmer sacked a man, well, um, he'd be looking out and perhaps the other farmer sacked a man and then they'd change over. If a farmer got a good man and he'd give notice to leave, the farmer would go around and tell all the neighbouring farmers not to employ him and try and starve the man out. That was our idea, yes. Oh, Lord, I've done it that time, yes. Oh, yes, Lord, I've done that time. Jobs may have been precarious, but there was always work for casual men at threshing time, when the summer grain harvest was separated from the straw at the end of the year. We had a steam engine, we had a thrashing tackle here in 1924. We started work then at seven o'clock in the morning. Well, you had to be on the engine at five o'clock to get up steam ready for seven o'clock. Use a lot of water, a lot of coal. To thrash, it would take about 14 minutes. Some would be on top of the rick, pitching the sheaves onto the drum. 
Others would be cleaning away the dust. Others would be sacking off the, the grain. Oh, that was a very hard, dirty job. Very hard. My job was to carry the corn. These sacks of wheat, they weighed 18 stone. I mean, I'm not very big and I'm not all that strong. Well, really, that's terrible hard work. I used to say if you carried 100 sacks a day, you'd done a good day's work. And when I was 55, I carried 135. And I can tell you, I went home jolly tired that night. That was all casual work. Well, when, when all this depression was, and people were out of work, they, they'd go round and says, well, where are you going to so-and-so? Asked the driver. The way they'd go, a gang of them would go to the farm and beg for a job. Well, he'd have a good look at them, and he'd pick out which he thought, you know, suited him, and the other ones could go. And that's how they went on. As the depression worsened, hundreds of thousands of acres of ploughland reverted to weeds. Many farmers went bankrupt. When the land didn't pay, we had to go on to stock, such as cows and pigs, etc. Then the time came when they didn't pay. Then we went back to uh, probably chickens. Then in the end, they didn't pay. And then we went back to bullocks. And in the end, they didn't pay. And in the end, we came back to land again. My father was a, kept bullocks, milked a few cows. Mother took butter to Exeter and sold it, I think, for about one and ten pence a pound. We probably took five quid a week. It was a, not a very good way of making a living. I remember one year in particular, it was probably about 1931, when we were forced to take fourpence halfpenny a gallon. And this was winter milk, which is now currently priced at 50 pence plus, about 54 pence a gallon, we were forced to take four and a half old pence. And this was absolutely disastrous, as you might imagine. Farmers in other countries were suffering too. World prices had fallen 35% since the war. Britain, wide open under free trade, was the major dumping ground for food surpluses at rock bottom prices. Farmers were crying out for help, but they wanted protection without interference. A conservative propaganda film played on the fear of snooping bureaucrats. National government of 1931, farmers got the protection they demanded without the meddling they dreaded. It was the first step in a policy of increasing help. The national government said, as it were, to the British agriculturist, we are anxious to help you. And if you will organize your industry to provide an adequate supply of good quality produce, we will help and encourage your schemes and protect you against foreign imports being dumped on the market. So here we have a square deal between the government, the farmer and the consumer. The milk producers were the first to benefit. Under the Marketing Act of 1933, the industry was allowed to organize its own collective schemes to sell produce. Farmers had to send their milk to the board, but in return, they got the security of a fixed income the price of milk to the customer would be maintained. There are two basic principles in the milk marketing scheme, namely the collective selling of all milk produced in this country and the sharing or pooling of the proceeds. This stabilized our farming here and Devon farming in particular, because here was a, a, an ideal dairy producing area, grass growing area, and we could keep cows, and they could be milked, and they could be profitable. Other marketing boards followed. In a few years, the most individual of industries had the strength of a monopoly supplier. 
all this business depends on small farms like these and on farmers like Mr. John. He is an independent farmer. His work being influenced by the Wheat Commission, the Meat Marketing Board, the Milk Marketing Board, the Potato Marketing Board, and the Egg Marketing Board. Apart from these organizations, he runs his farm as he likes. Of course, people didn't like to have their freedom taken away from them to be... But, of course, uh, as time went on, everybody recognized that the Milk Marketing Board had put a stability into uh, the milk uh, industry. And, and, indeed, the trade, though they grumbled about it, they didn't do too badly either. The new system for selling more milk to the public at better prices was accompanied by another change on the farm. More attention was paid to cleanliness. Well, in the early days of hand milking, you'd uh, have perhaps a three-leg stool, uh, and uh, that never got scrubbed very often, and, and your hands were always got a little bit damp. And we used to sit and look at the cow, and you'd just wipe round it. If, if they were really dirty, wipe round it with an old cloth and, and carry on with the milking. In 1928, when the Norfolk County Council decided that they would try and interest the farmers in producing a cleaner product, when they came in, they were white coats and white hats and washed your cows' udders and all the rest of it, and they just showed how to... And, and I got to like the job. The job was already changing, like most farming work, with mechanization. Milking machinery and portable milking sheds transformed the dairy farm. More cows could now be kept by fewer men. We used to have to have, of course, uh, large numbers of people milking by hand. And, uh, and also the workmen's wives. Uh, you never took a man on unless his wife uh, could and would milk because you had to have those pair of milking hands, you see. When machine milk would come in for the cows, it meant that uh, you'd be milking four cows at a time and, and two of you could easily look after that. So instead of having four or five men, there was just two men left or a man and a boy. Uh, the, the machinery, of course, did dry the men off the farm. Mechanization came to the corn harvest first. With the reaper and binder, men were no longer needed to hand scythe and bundle the crops. When a tractor pulled the binder, more labor was saved. But the grain still had to be threshed by gangs of men later. The shape of things to come was shown with the first combine harvesters from America. They could cut the crop and thresh the grain, all in one process. The new equipment cut drudgery but reduced jobs. The farm workers were too isolated and weak to challenge it, even if they'd wanted to. You didn't try to get all your men to do that any more than you had all your men driving horses, you see. But usually, the skilled man, the teamsman, he could quite readily take to driving tractors and did. On the old forts and standards, they were really devils to start in the cold morning. Perhaps you'd swing, swing for an hour before you'd get them going. And they wouldn't pull until they were hot. Now, you may not believe this, but I've boiled away as much as 10 gallons of water a day. That's the truth. On a very long day, hot summertime, they were boiling hot. The oil used to get hot. And the oil in the gearbox, it'd be so hot you couldn't bear your feet on it. But in the wintertime, that was a different story. You sat and froze with cold, you had no cabs. I've had two overcoats on, two pairs of gloves, a pair of plastic leggings. And then I've been frozen, I could howl the cold. And uh, of course, was a bit, a bit unlucky. The boss used to do it in the fine dry weather, and now he done it in the cold weather. See, it's the same old story. John Hodge get the rough end every time. Well, I, I really didn't mind the, the machine as far as that go, but I felt it when men had to leave. I didn't like men having to leave a job. because automation was coming and, and this was inevitable and we had to accept it. The way may be long, but a great start has been made. 
the farmer is now beginning to get better prices for his products and consequently can afford to buy more machinery and more implements for use on the farm. The wages of farm workers have already been increased in 42 out of 47 agricultural districts. The purchasing power of the countryside is on the increase. So after all, the towns have not lost their country customers. Farmers and farm workers now come into the market, not only to sell, but to buy. I thought I was doing fairly well then. When I got two pounds a week, I thought I'd got a good job. I remember one, when we got the three pounds a week, one farmer says, well, if farm workers are going to get three pounds a week, we'll all be farm workers. There came a time when he was reduced to farm workers' ranks. And I says, what about it now, old mate? He took his three pound and then grumbled. September 1939, the English countryside. Its most important crop, English countrymen. Sunday, September the 3rd, in the middle of harvest, comes news of war. been launched. The Minister of Agriculture and Fisheries has appointed a War Agricultural Executive Committee for each county in England and Wales. The Minister has made an order authorizing these committees to exercise on his behalf certain powers conferred on him by the defense regulations. When the war broke out in 39, the Minister had to set up some local committees to see that uh, his program of food production home food production was carried out and so he set up agricultural executive committees in every county they were composed of farmers with his officials and they allocated to each farmer a plowing quota and a cereal quota and a potato quota but how are we going to set about it by going to our neighbors and persuading them to plow up so much pasture what was the basis, Mr. Turner? Try for at least 10% of the existing grassland. Not only 10%, gentlemen, at least 10%. Ha! That won't make us very popular visitors. Well done. What can you give me? Say 20 acres? Yes, 20. 18 of another field. And five or six in another field, which I might be able to break up later on. Ha! Huh. That's an easy start. He's away at Ipswich. I came to see him about ploughing up some more grassland. Well, I don't know how he'll take that. That will mean a tractor and uh, where's the money to come from? You had to be a little careful. It wasn't an easy job because a lot of them didn't want you at all. But you see, then they couldn't get any feeding stuff. They couldn't get any fuel. They couldn't get any petrol. They couldn't get any paraffin unless it was allocated by the Warwick Culture Committee. So they had to really sort of toe the line a bit and come down to it. And it was difficult. Uh, some people didn't want to be helped. Some people were very pleased with it. Well, there's only 32 acres and you've got a tractor. What about my cattle and water troughs? Well, that won't be all lost. You'll get the government grant for 64 pounds. I'll give you 64 quid to mind your own business and clear off. How about the field by the wood? No good play on that, it's too wet. What do you think on the old drain to do it good? Yes, it would, but who's going to pay for it? Well, if you've got a government ground, would you plow? Oh, yes, I'd be glad to. The government paid the bill as land that had been uneconomical to farm for 50 years was drained. When grassland has become waterlogged, it must first be drained. So the old steam engine pulls the mold drain across the fields. When that's been done, the tractors take charge. We had to allocate every tractor, every plough, 
every combine. And in 1942, when I first had mine, we had an allocation of three. And we only had two people wanted them, so I had the other. And in 1945, we had an application of 400 people wanted them. And we had 17 to, you know, to allocate. And that was how it grew during the war. And of course, people were desperate for help. And that was one way which they hoped they'd get help. New strains and varieties developed with more government help increased yields. So did new fertilizers and weed killers. And there was every incentive to use them because the ministry paid high prices for all the farmers could grow. In 1939, the country had produced only 30% of its own food. By 1945, nearly 80%. The acreage of wheat had almost doubled. This year, I shall sell about 600 sacks of grain, more than three times what I did in pre-war days. We've eight men and two girls working at Upton Manor Farm. I pay 600 pounds a year in rent, and I've got upwards of 8,000 pounds invested in livestock, crops, and machinery, an average of 15 pounds an acre. The work you see going on here today is typical of what's going on all over England, on big farms and small, all of them producing food to fill the nation's larder. After the war, uh, we built up to a, a substantial production of food in this country. We were producing, I think, somewhere near 80% of our total requirements. We started then, of course, to import uh, the available food from abroad again, and this tended to depress prices at home. Three out of every four sides hanging here in Smithfield Market are imported. Half of them come from dollar countries. Meat imports for the first eight months of this year cost 99 million pounds. The strategic need for self-sufficiency had been shown in the two wars. Now an economic crisis placed new demands on farmers. The Labour government responded with the 1947 Agriculture Act, introduced by Tom Williams. During the war, the farmers and farm workers of Britain stood between us and starvation. Today, they are still fighting the battle for bread. When that battle has been won, they will be able to bring us more of the other foods we want. Milk, meat, eggs, vegetables, fruit. But they must not be let down as they were after the 1914-18 war. The Agriculture Bill aims at giving farmers an assured market and guaranteed prices for their principal products, while at the same time ensuring a higher level of efficiency. These principles are endorsed not only by all sections of the industry itself, but by all political parties. The arrangements were generous. Prices would be kept up to give farmers an adequate income and return on capital. They'd have a hand in setting prices themselves when the National Farmers Union took part in the annual price review. More dramatic ideas, such as land nationalization, had been dismissed. With guaranteed prices, farming became an industry with a difference. Every crop was profitable. And we sort of, sort of fancied uh, growing cabbages, so they were profitable. We grew cauliflowers, and they were profitable. One might say farmers were on a seller's market to some extent. Now, if you're on a seller's market, things are much easier. Supply and demand, whatever mechanism you may have, you'll never get away from supply and demand. And the truth was that we were very short of food, very short of foreign exchange, and uh, therefore it was much easier to negotiate um, good prices uh, than it uh, later became. The government then were willing to plough a lot of money into research and so were the, the, uh, the commercial firms, you know, Fison's and ICI and people like that were quite prepared to spend a lot of money because they could see a good return on it um, by increasing productivities on the farms. And farmers took it up, and the amount of extra feed, and the better feed that went into the stock, you know, altered very considerably over the following 20 years. And we are still feeling the benefit of that now. In the hill country, prosperity came more slowly. The hillmen had always been the industry's poor relations. Raising sheep on difficult land in all weathers 
Theirs was the toughest and most precarious farming of all. But the new policy of generous help was extended to them too. Tom Williams brought in his Hill Farming Act and the government recognised the importance of hill farming and tried to increase the productivity and the status of the hill farmer. Uh, we had grants for roads, we had grants for buildings, we had grants for reclamation work, we had stock grants, headage payments to compensate us for, I shouldn't say living in this part of the world on a day like this, but for the, most of the year, all the year. They gave farmers subsidies on practically every commodity they had, on all the corn, the milk, the cattle, on the fertilizers, the drainage, the ditching, practically everything. They had subsidies. Well, they called them feather bedded farmers, and of course they were in those days. They had it jolly good. Now, of course, this led to very much ill-informed criticism uh, about farmers being feather bedded. I think the housewife and the taxpayer have been babysitting the farmer all too long, and it's time to call a halt. That, of course, was Stanley Evans. Now in the quarrying business, he had to resign from the Labour government, you'll remember, over that famous phrase about our farming industry. Mr Evans, seven years ago, you said that the British farmer was feather bedded. Are you still of that opinion? Yes, indeed I am. And well, the farmers know it. Between 1949 and 56, they had two and a half thousand million pounds out of the taxpayer in subsidies of one kind and another. When the Conservatives came back in 1951, they continued to support the farmers. Great political battles were fought over other industries, but the policy for farming was consistent, and relations with government as agreeable as ever. Yes, I, I, I don't think I've ever seen so many farmers together before. <laughs> Our task is to reconcile stability with freedom. And we propose in consultation with the leaders of the National Farmers Union <coughs> to do this by steering a mid-course between the restrictions and interference of the 40s and the hazards of the loose freedom of the early 30s. Recently, I had a look around the countryside. The ground was fully worked and showed the effects of good fertilization. A great job of modernization has been done in recent years and it really was a joy to find the country in such good heart. And did you know that net output is up roughly two-thirds more than it was before the war? And world prices have been falling at the same time. So here again in agriculture, we've got a most wonderful success story to tell. The farmers knew how to deal with politicians. But there was nothing they could do about acts of God or bad luck. In 1958, foot and mouth disease reached the Somerset farm of Arthur Court. The slaughtermen were called in. The first thing that happened, they said, well, you, you better tie, the, the, these cows were tied up in the shed with chains at the time, you better untie the, the, the tee on the chain and just connect uh, the thing with a bit of string so that to, when the cow is killed that we can cut the string and, and remove the carcass quite easily. So this was done. Well, eventually they started to, to slaughter the, the cows, at, but at, at this stage I just couldn't, uh, I couldn't stick it any longer and uh, <coughs> retired to the house where I couldn't hear the shots. But the disaster was that uh, within a few minutes somebody came hammering at the door to say that one of the slaughtermen had shot himself through the knee and I had to cart him off to hospital. This was a ricochet bullet off the, the concrete the manger. So the other man had to plot on um, single-handedly. Well, eventually, if you can imagine a more gruesome sight than, than seeing 50 or so cows um, prostrate in, in one building, you know, um, it's something I shall never forget. 
somebody was in here the other day and we, they were arguing, they were putting out all, they were highly academic, academic people, and they said, well, no, I said, what, would it, what do you think it would take to make a farmer? What ingredients would it take? Well, they said all he wants is 40% muscle, 40% brain, but he must have 20% good luck. Without good luck, he couldn't exist, and I'm sure he couldn't. Rocketing land values due to inflation were the best luck the farmers ever had, and made many rich men. The first farm which we bought in, was in 1948, and that was 430 acres, and uh, that cost £14,000. Well, that particular farm today would be worth at least 700000 Ray Topham had started his farm after the war. He thought big and worked hard. In those days, to get a combine harvester, um, you had to get an allocation from the ministry. And they did allocate us this small um, harvester. And I always remember, I worked right through the harvest on it, and I always used to take sandwiches with me, and I'd go all day long. I'd never stop until it was too dark or too wet. And I always remember, I went contracting, and I actually earned 500 pounds with this combine harvester. I actually earned his cost in the first year. As I took on more land, what I used to do is make my fields bigger. And then, in turn, by making the fields bigger, I could afford bigger machines to farm the bigger fields. But the steady progress of the farmers was disturbed in the early 60s. A major political initiative threatened the security they'd come to take for granted, the bid to join Europe. Farming is one of the big obstacles to joining the common market. British farmers got more than £250 million in subsidies from the taxpayer last year. If we go into the common market, they stand to lose these subsidies. Do you think if we had to do without uh, subsidies, that would bother the farmers? Well, we practically live on subsidies. Do you think we ought to go in with the European countries in the common market? We can't go into it. And do you think we'll be able to compete with the foreigner? Of course we can compete. We can compete with the whole blinking world. We're Norfolk people. We care for nobody. That confidence wasn't shared by the Farmers' Union or by its then president. A doubter, he was called to see Prime Minister Macmillan. But I suppose really that I was taken to him to be given the treatment, you see. But I don't know um, what the two-hour discussion that we then had did for him but it didn't do anything for me. I did not believe it was uh, good for agriculture in the long term, and that was my main remit. Nor did I believe, further than that, that it was good for the country. Ten years later, after Lord Woolley had retired, another Conservative Prime Minister took Britain into Europe on the second attempt. No one had watched the long negotiations with more self-interest than the farmers. Their old price support system would be replaced by the common agricultural policy. It was a risk. The old certainties were gone. No, I can't say that made any difference to farm workers' lives at all. Uh, it benefited the farmers more than us. Disease, you see, the only thing that affected us is, is our union and the wages board. They looked after our interests. Otherwise, we shouldn't have had very much. Well, I don't think that during the common market affected the, the ordinary agricultural worker. It benefited the farmers, but not us. There were some farmers who didn't do well. Europe, with its different priorities, put the livestock farmers' interests way behind the cereal growers. In 1974, it was the beef farmers who suffered. The reason why the beef has collapsed at the moment, when we've had falls in beef before, is that the rug was pulled out. Our guarantee, which we've enjoyed for 30 years, was taken away from us. We feel let down to the extent that we responded to a call, a national call. We've, we've uh, brought this about, we've produced efficiently the amount of beef that's on the market today, and it's reflecting on us. I don't know how it's going to go, because it's sliding down in all the time. How big is your overdraft? Oh, it's somewhere in the region of £60,000 now. £60,000? As much pounds. as that, yes. But the cost of interest alone. We can't service this. We're out of business. And there are hundreds of livestock farmers like this up and down the country. It's pathetic. 
there were no complaints from the cereal farmers. Brussels was committed to buying up all the grain it was offered at prices often above the world market level. So more and more land was turned over to cereals and was farmed with increasing efficiency. Yields per acre rose steadily. Farmers learned how to get a higher price from the corn merchants than Brussels would pay. Yes. We've got 250 tons, Bob. Yes. Would you suggest that I put this away? Well, I think we, we could market this in November at a, a sufficiently good premium over the September price yes. to make it worth your while holding it. If you go back 40 years, uh, a ton an acre was a good crop. Now, I suppose most people average two, and exceptional ones, where there's a lot of stock kept and exceptional farmers, um, perhaps three or perhaps even more. We are using now uh, 10 times more manures or fertilizers than we were 10 years ago, at least, at least. For the milk producers, it's been the same story. Better yields, more mechanization, better management. We are much better at managing, I think, now than we were um, 30 years ago. We're, we're better trained. Uh, nearly every farmer's son now goes to college and has got sort of business training, and he knows you know, what is happening. Do your yields have gone from uh, what, four, five, six hundred gallons per cow per year up to 12 or 1300 gallons per cow per year, just purely through breeding and better feeding. The farmers are proud of their success. They measure it in the tons of grain they can get from an acre or the gallons of milk from a cow. From 1920, yields almost stood still until the war, then rose a quarter by 1950. The yield of wheat per acre had doubled again by 1980. Milk per cow was up another 90%. Manpower fell two-thirds over the same period. But equally spectacular has been the public money the farmers have received in subsidies and grants. In 1980, agriculture received £358 million from the Exchequer and £1,570 million from the EEC's high food prices. Through the years, this massive input affected the sort of farming that was done and the use made of poorer land, as one farmer explained. It's sometimes difficult to bury the seed in my stony Hampshire fields. Nevertheless, the crops get better every year. This is simply because the prices I get for my crops and animals leave me enough margin to farm well. Farmers have been free to farm well because of a consensus that a strong farming industry, growing as much food as possible at home, was worth the price. Richard Boddy, a Conservative MP and ex-farmer himself, questions that view. We have been bringing into production poor quality land to grow fabulous yields of wheat. And the triumph had been fantastic, there's no doubt about it, not only in arable crops, but also in dairy production, pig production, and so forth. But it has been at a tremendous cost, and it's time now to measure that cost. And we've got to measure it in several ways. So far as the uh, consumer is concerned, uh, it's five or six pounds a week on top of the ordinary uh, bills. And that's a lot of money for the ordinary family. But then the taxpayer generally is paying something like five to six thousand uh, millions uh, a year, as it's going to be very soon. And this has all got to come out of profitable industries, industries that don't have to go to the government and say, let's have some more money. I think that Mr. Body's views, as I understand them, are a travesty of the fact. Our job is about filling the larders of this country and these esoteric arguments may be very interesting from an academic point of view but they don't fill people's bellies as regards his general thesis that you should let uh, agriculture simply run less fair all i can say is that in my early days that's just what it did and people went bankrupt and farmers headed the list of bankruptcies and uh, cattle that had, uh, that had cost a uh, uh, price in, in, in uh, uh, time of purchase 
When they came to sell them, they were selling them for half what they'd given for them. Well, nobody can go on that basis. And so if, uh, if suddenly the structure was uh, dismantled, destroyed, then you would have a very hard time. The Milk Board's regular collection still protects the dairy farmers, but they aren't as secure as they once were, as EEC policy alters. Other farm prices are also changing, and even farmers doing well say the business is riskier since Europe. I would say that the gamble is bigger now, the stakes are somewhat bigger, and the, the room for error is much less. In those days, if you made an error, you made less profit. Now if you make an error, you're in, you're in dead trouble. As far as my actual worth on the paper, I, I wouldn't really know, but um, it's certainly not less than five million. But um, I wouldn't know really. The, the value would be between about five and seven, I suppose. A million pounds, I suppose. It's always been my uh, philosophy that everything on the farm I can do myself. I'd never ask a man to do anything which I couldn't do myself. I'm always on the farm before seven in the morning. 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 Roy, anyway, you, you go off with Victor then and Ron when he comes. And um, hopefully it will keep dry. I think one thing that has been a big help is the structure of our industry. We do work in small uh, units. And there is, shall we say, a team spirit, the, 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 the farmer and his men, they work together and, and nature's the master of us all and we're all trying to serve the land and you know we're all involved in the job. I know that it works in agriculture and agriculture has performed in this way and I believe always will as, lo as long as we have the, the same sort of structure as we have now. All my life, even when I was with, with father, the relationship between the man and the f farmer was a very friendly, um, indeed, friendship, I think, describes it. I, I still got the man who's been with me over 30 years, 32 years, I think he's been with me. And I, I mean, we're on Christian name terms. He never calls me by Christian name, actually. I always use his Christian name. But um, I would say we're um, on very good terms. In fact, you know, uh, his wife give my children Christmas presents. Our kids give uh, Christmas presents. And that kind of relationship. My living is as much dependent on them as theirs is me. And um, I can attribute a lot of my success to my men because um, we've worked together as a team. And um, uh, this is how I feel it should be. We all say this, if he's making money, then we're in a job. And that's as simple as that. We're making money if he's making money. And we like to see more land because we know we're all that much safer in a job. Once it was government policy to increase employment on the land. In the 1920s, a new crop, sugar beet, was introduced, partly because it gave work to so many men to harvest and cut it. One machine now harvests acres of beet. Efficient farming had replaced jobs on the land as a political aim and was achieved. But in farming, high productivity hasn't brought high wages. There are 125,000 farm workers now, and they earn the fourth lowest industrial wage in the country, though the job's more technical. No doubt there's not so much skill today in hedge laying and that sort of thing, because you've got machines, but I take pride in my work. I'm not saying that everybody does, but yeah, we can still play with straight flowers, they could them days if you like. I mean, you go into a field of dough, you start one side and you plow it, you get the other side. There's no skill attached to it now. I mean, the youngsters, they really don't know what plowing is, not in comparison to the old days. In less than 50 years, the British countryside became more productive than most of the other industries that people left the fields to join. Working the land has meant something different to the farmer, the farm worker, the city dweller. It's an emotional, not just a financial involvement. 
but many who stayed had no choice. Well, there was nothing else really to do. Uh, agriculture was the main industry in the villages. Uh, I wanted to be a carpenter, but I just couldn't afford, to, because I was the oldest boy of a family of 11, we just couldn't afford to uh, be an apprentice. So I went on to the farm and I gradually go to like the job. Affection. I don't know that I did look back for anything. I'm going to tell you uh, something I've told several people. I never did like farming. As far as taking it easy, um, I just couldn't. It's not in me to take it easy. And uh, my farming, really, although it's work, I do enjoy it. And it is uh, just, you know, it's my way of life. I had two days in a factory at Leiston, and I got so fed up that I packed it in. The noise was too much. I couldn't stand the noise being shut up. And I, I loved the life. I loved the horses. I loved the cattle. And I loved the plough. And I loved the job. To be in the country, you know, in the summertime, all this lovely fresh air and the sun and all the country scenes. I could work in a field all day long alone and never be lonely. There's so much going on around you. All the animal life, the crops growing, the birds singing, you hear the cook go. Well, it's like being in heaven. It's just, that was my life. It was my father's life, my grandfather's life. That was born, that was bred in me, that was in my blood. I'm a, really a true Suffolk farm worker. Does that answer your question? itself that the country's job is rarely finished. Its labours of the day before may only mean another cabbage in cotton garden, another egg on the breakfast table, another bottle on the doorstep. But that's what the housewife is waiting for. She's waiting for the country to come to town. And it's so well organised nowadays that it never fails her. Just as she looks, the delivery vans are bringing the riches of Mother Earth round the corner. The country has come to town, bringing the fine fresh produce of the land every morning without fail to keep the city workers going. They don't think of it, but they couldn't go about their business if the country workers didn't labour for them. That's why, behind the city crowds of a morning, in the streets across the bridges, you should always see a vision of the fields of England. That film was made in 1984. Since then, the situation for British farmers, particularly the cereal growers, has changed. Both the British government and the EEC are reducing some of their supports. Last year, farm incomes fell overall. And a fully illustrated book based on the series of All Our Working Lives is available from booksellers.